Hey there folks and welcome back. Up to now we've been doing calculus almost exclusively with functions y equals f of x or more recently z equals f of x y. These functions take in one or more inputs but always spit out just a single output. Their graphs are curved lines in R2 or curved surfaces in R3. In this video however we're going to consider a different type of function. It's going to take in just one input called a parameter and will spit out multiple outputs. It's called a parametric equation, and the graph it traces out is known as a parametric curve. Okay, we're going to begin our discussion with a classic example, the unit circle in R2. This is the curve that we get from the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1, and it's something that's definitely of interest to us as mathematicians. Notice, however, that it is not the graph of a function y equals f of x, because it fails the vertical line test. Ah, uh, this is too bad, because we like the unit circle, but we also like working with things of the form y equals f of x. So what do we do? I guess one option would be to break things into cases and consider the upper half circle, which has y as a function of x, and separately consider the lower half circle, uh, but nobody wants to break their work into cases. That's too much work. So instead, I'm going to give you a different way to describe this curve. To see how this works, suppose that we have a little bug walking around the border of the circle. At time t, the bug's position is given by cos t sine t. We know that every point along our circle can be described with these coordinates. Now suppose that we let the bug walk for 2 pi units of time, starting from t equals 0 and going all the way to t equals 2 pi. That means the bug is going to start from this point here, 1, 0, and as t goes to 2 pi, it's going to walk all the way around the circle once counterclockwise, and it ends back where it started. Ah, but check it out. The bug's path gives us a new way to describe this curve. Our circle consists of all points x, y, where at time t, x is equal to cos t and y is equal to sine t. We've described the circle not with y as a function of x, but with x and y both as functions of a new variable t. To emphasize this, we often write x of t and y of t. It's also important to specify which values of t we're considering. Here we're taking t between 0 and 2 pi, but if instead we had taken t between 0 and pi, we would have traced out just half of our circle. This equation altogether is what we call a parametric equation. We could alternatively think of the circle in terms of vectors. Imagine that at time t we have a vector pointing from the origin to the bug's position on the circle. As t goes from 0 to 2 pi, the tip of that vector traces out the entire unit circle. So we could describe our circle using what we call a vector function. Our circle is traced out by the function r of t, which at time t gives us a vector of outputs, x of t, y of t, which again is equal to cos t sine t. We let t go from 0 to 2 pi. Now in a moment we're going to jump into some examples to give you a bit more practice with parametric equations and vector functions. But first, it's important to note that this is not the only way we could have parametrized our circle. Suppose for example that we had another bug, this little yellow bug here, that moves according to the path x of t y of t equals cos 2t minus sine 2t, where again t is going to go from 0 to 2 pi. Notice that if you take our x and y coordinates for the yellow bug and you plug them into this equation, the equation will still be satisfied. This means that our yellow bug really is walking along the unit circle, just like the pink bug, except now the yellow bug might be following a slightly different path. In particular, notice that the yellow bug's y coordinate has a negative on it, which means while my pink bug started by moving in the positive y direction, my yellow bug is going to start by moving in the negative y direction. Another difference is that my yellow bug has 2t in its x and y components. Since t is going from 0 to 2 pi, 2t is going to go from 0 to 4 pi, which means my yellow bug doesn't just walk around this circle once, it actually goes around twice. So although the two bugs trace out the same curve, they do so by following two different paths. Now maybe you've heard the term parametric curve or vector function in the past. You probably used vector functions to describe the equations of lines in linear algebra. Here's a little refresher. Suppose that we have a line through two points in R2, A, B, and C, D. 
A vector equation of this line is given by AB, that's a point on the line, plus T times a direction vector. Well, if we start at AB and we want to move towards CD, we could use the direction vector C minus A, D minus B. To describe this entire line, we should let T belong to the entire set of real numbers. All right, folks, take a step back and look at what we've done. We've expressed our coordinates at a point x, y along our line as functions of t. We've written down a parametric equation, or a vector function, that describes this line in R2. What if instead of the whole line, we just wanted this line segment from a, b to c, d? Well, to do that, we can simply restrict the t values on our existing line. Rather than taking all t from the real numbers, let's just take t from 0 to 1. When t is 0, we're at a, b, and I'll let you check that when t is 1, we're over here at c, d. Another curve that's easily parametrized is the graph of a function, y equals f of x. The reason I say it's easy is because, well, it's already parametrized. Let's think about this. x is moving left and right, and as x moves, y changes according to the definition of our function. So x is essentially the parameter t, and y is given by f of t. Our vector function is t f of t, and the t values we should pick depend entirely on the domain of this function. For example, if the domain of the function consists of all x values between minus 1 and 1, well then those are the t values we're going to consider. If instead the domain is all x values on the real line, well then those are the t values we're going to consider. So maybe I'll just write t belongs to the function's domain. On the first slide, I showed you how to parametrize a circle of radius 1. We had the vector function x of t, y of t equals cos t sine t for t between 0 and 2 pi. How would you parametrize a circle, though, of radius r? Well, let's think about this. We want to stretch out our x and y coordinates each by a factor of r. So we can simply use the parametrization x equals r cos t, y equals r sine t. Once again, t is going to go from 0 to 2 pi. Just like our circle on the first slide, this circle is traced out in the counterclockwise direction. Ah, now here's something to think about. What if we stretched out our x and y components by different factors? Take, for example, this vector function. r of t equals 3 cos t 2 sine t, where t goes from 0 to 2 pi. What would the graph of this function look like? Well, it should be pretty similar to a circle, right? This parametrization looks a lot like what we have above, except now x is stretched out by a bit more than y. Specifically, since cos and sine take on values between minus 1 and 1, x is going to take on values between minus 3 and 3, and y is going to take on values between minus 2 and 2. What we actually have here is the equation of an ellipse. It's an ellipse that's long in the x-axis and skinny in the y-axis. Might look something like this. As an exercise, think about how you might parametrize the other type of ellipse, an ellipse that's long in the y-direction and skinny in the x-direction. Now, just like our circle above, this ellipse is traced in the counterclockwise direction. What would you have to change about this parametrization to trace the ellipse in the clockwise direction? All of our examples so far have taken place in R2, but our discussion on parametric equations and vector functions can be easily extended to R3. We just need to add one more component to write z as a function of t. Doing this will allow us to trace out some crazy curves living in three-dimensional space. See, usually we're used to tracing out curved surfaces using functions z equals f of x, y, but now we're going to be able to trace out curved lines in R3 as well. Take, for example, this circle you see here. It's the unit circle, but it's sitting in the xy plane. We could parametrize it just like we did before. x is cos t, y is sine t, and notice that since we never leave the xy plane, z is always 0. Once again, t is going to go from 0 to 2 pi. What about this crazy thing, this helix living in R3? Well, it sort of looks like x and y are moving in a circular pattern, but z is increasing as we wind around. So we could probably parametrize this using something like x equals cos t, y equals sine t, and we want z to increase, right? So why don't we just set z equals t? 
Since it looks like the helix is living exclusively above the xy plane, right, where z is non-negative, we should insist that our t values are greater than or equal to zero. So there you have it, folks, your brief introduction to parametric curves in R2 and R3. In the next lesson, we're going to learn how to do some calculus with these curves, and then we'll check out some applications.